this many people in the building. First thing in the morning. <laughs> this is kind of surprising. Maybe the smaller room is strategic. It looks full. Cool. Ready? All right, cool. I guess we'll get started here. Um, so, big thanks for everybody coming out. Um, I actually have a uh, ton of uh, material, and I'm going to have to blaze through this really fast. I'm actually doing a long-form version of this, I hope, at a security conference next year, so look for the uh, CFP to vote on that. Um, so, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I just recently, uh, within the last year, set up an uh, incident response function at a mid-sized um, technology company, and uh, so I'm not an expert on this by any chance uh, or stretch. Uh, I really like this stuff. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to dig in. Um, but my goal for the talk really here is that if there's anybody who's in IT right now or in security and looking at setting up an uh, incident response function at their company or their organization, that this makes it uh, easier for them to get started. Uh, so what, first of all, what is uh, DFIR? Uh, this means Digital Forensics Incident Response, if you haven't figured it out yet. Is that like um, this kind of crack team of paramedics that shows up at your computer and, and it's having malware problems and kind of go uh, clear and you jump the computer and it's back to good? Or uh, what exactly does that mean? Um, so Incident Response, uh, the way I define it, is it's, uh, it's an application of digital forensics but it's uh, specifically for security incidents and trying to respond to security incidents. Um, and the interesting thing about it to me is that um, it, there's a heavy human aspect to it, so you really have to understand kind of the motives and, and the operation and the assumptions of the people that are attacking you, um, but also you have to be very dispassionate in, in, your, um, in your analysis. So you have to make sure that you're not jumping to conclusions and, and having an emotional response and then letting your, your response um, kind of lead you down that path. Um, there's always an adversary uh, when you're doing incident response. There's always a human at the other end, which is not necessarily true if you're doing pen testing or attacking where maybe you're just attacking a system that hasn't been watched for years um, and it's just kind of you against the machine. And um, also there's a unique requirement for efficiency in DFIR um, because you could always spend more time doing something, uh, but you have to evaluate whether that's really uh, a good investment of your time. So first of all, where would you start if you were setting this up in your company or organization? This is what uh, I would consider the first steps, and, and you do need to do these first. Uh, you want to consult all the stakeholders in your company, and especially company executives, if you have access to the executive team, different departments like legal, HR, uh, the different data owners, and find out uh, what data is important to them, uh, what they think would be embarrassing, or what they think is the highest priority to respond to, and then kind of uh, mold your strategy around that and come up with a, an incident response strategy that matches what your uh, organizational values are. Write it down as a plan. This is really important, it sounds boring. Um, and then call out things like the escalation path, at what point during an incident should you escalate. Uh, and I would say contact an outside incident response firm ahead of time. So one of the very first things that you're doing is you should go out and survey the different incident response teams that you could get services from and uh, just have a call with them, maybe set up a retainer or something like that. So if you're ever in the middle of an incident, you actually know who to call right away rather than going out to the yellow pages and like, oh my gosh, uh, a incident response. Um, uh, then you would have, uh, acquire tools, you practice with those tools, and then debrief at the end and kind of go back and iterate through this process again. And tabletop exercises I found were pretty interesting that uh, didn't find gaps. Uh, so this is all really boring, right? Um, it, it, it's not fun, it's not sexy, but it's critical to success. And I would argue that it's way more sexy to be confident you know what you're doing uh, than to be kind of fumbling around. Um, it, make sure that you're doing things for the right reasons. So have a reason for everything that you're doing and make sure that that aligns with uh, what the values of your company are. Uh, obviously practice. You want to identify gaps early and then come up with a way to, uh, to close those gaps. And I can't stress enough that making up as you go along is just not a great approach, especially when you have C-levels looking over your shoulder saying, did we catch them yet? Did we catch them yet? Uh, so don't be this dog. <laughs> you really don't want to do that. It's not cool. Uh, so a few lessons here really quickly. Uh, you want to find out what legal and HR care about. Um, if your legal department or your HR department just doesn't care about like porn, don't go invest a whole bunch of resources in trying to find porn images because it's, who cares? Um, train your IR or your IT staff on collection. So if you're a member of the security team, 
Uh, chances are you'll probably need IT to help you do some of the collection. Uh, stick to the plan. So again, don't deviate, don't make it up as you go along. Uh, the chain of custody stuff is actually pretty useful depending on what you're doing. So knowing what the, um, you know, the chain of custody is supposed to be for evidence. Wikis, I found, were pretty great. You can document stuff there. Other teams can look at it. What's our procedure for this? What's our pre procedure for this? Uh, and then just read a whole bunch. This is my strategy for everything. Maybe other people work differently, um, but I just read a ton of books. Uh, so diving into, okay, now how can we apply this? What sort of tools would you need? Uh, so I, in my experience, hardware matters a lot. If you try to do collection with a USB flash drive, you're just going to be waiting forever. Um, so an SSD is a huge benefit here. Of course, you want to know what uh, connectors are on the, um, the IT systems that you use. Um, and have an analysis system set up. You should probably have that isolated on your network, uh, segmented off, uh, snapshot that analysis system so that you can go back. Probably a good idea actually to run AV on there. Maybe you want to exclude your acquisition directory, uh, but it would be really stupid if you infected your IR analysis machine. Uh, and then you need to plan for storage of images, so capturing disk images or full memory images, you need to plan for where you can store those. Uh, so this is the route that I went for doing acquisition. Uh, this is not for disk acquisition, this is for memory, volatile uh, images. Uh, but like I said, the SSD just speeds this process up so much. And that's an external drive enclosure. So you just plug the SSD into that, connect it, and off you go. Uh, so on the software side, before you get into the software side, you need to know uh, what systems you're going to be acquiring from, uh, what operating systems you're going to be using, and then plan your tools based on that. And then you're going to need uh, potentially separate tools for acquiring memory, so grabbing the, the full copy of the memory on the machine, volatile information such as sockets, DNS, cache, uh, that type of processes, that type of thing, and then uh, disk or file system um, uh, acquisition. Are you going to need to do remote acquisition? That's important to know. Do you have remote offices? Do you have staff in those offices that can help you out? Uh, and I would strongly recommend starting with free tools and then seeing where the gaps are in those free tools and then going out and buying commercial tools. Um, don't overspend on this unless you, uh, you, know, you really know that you have to spend money on that. Along those lines, here's some free online tools. These are really helpful, especially URL query. I use this all the time. Has anybody heard of URL query? Um, yeah, so <laughs> this is hugely helpful. If you get phishing messages, you can go out, you can set the refer, and you can say, okay, if I was using this browser and went to this URL, what would happen? Uh, really huge. And JS Unpack is great too, deobfuscating JavaScript code. Uh, so a lesson on these online tools here is uh, you want to be really careful what you leak. So as you're doing this analysis and this research, every time you go out and connect to one of these websites, you're sending you know, the IP address of your company, uh, what browser you're running, what headers in the browser, um, the refer, if you're clicking on a link from somewhere else, that's all being sent off site. And you want to be really careful whether that's information you really want to go to that website or outside parties. Um, I would definitely recommend getting familiar with Tor, Tor browser. Uh, I do most all of my analysis and, and research online through Tor, so that way the bad guys can't see that I'm coming after them, or at least they don't know which company. Uh, and consider running some of these sandbox things in-house. So set up your own instance of Cuckoo, um, set up your own version of PDF X-Ray, uh, so that you're not uploading stuff to websites. It can be really stupid if you uploaded like a corporate company secret plan dot doc uh, into some public sandbox, and you don't know what they do with it. I mean, they might say that they keep it private, but you just, you don't know. Um, so an example of a tool set here, this pretty closely matches what we use, uh, would be an SSD in an, in an external drive enclosure for doing the acquisition. Um, the sysinternal suite, the sysinternal is for Windows, uh, full you know, registry information, auto run, stuff like that. Memorize, free tool for Mandiant. Uh, there's also a Mac version of that, so you can do memory acquisition from Macs. FTK Imager, uh, that can do a lot of things. We use that primarily for disk acquisition and uh, file system information. Uh, Redline, another free tool for Mandiant which uh, does the analysis of your, uh, your memory and your processes and your DLLs um, and things like that. Volatility is uh, a really powerful tool. It's command line, uh, but it allows you to really carve into memory images and really extract a lot of intelligence out of them. And then uh, spreadsheets are actually pretty important. A spreadsheet tool, uh, because you're going to get a lot of the output from these in text files, and so you want to be able to <coughs> sort those text files and display them in some kind of logical uh, method. So I would actually recommend this spreadsheet program. Right? Um, so some do's and don'ts. Don't stand in front of the slides. Um, don't <laughs> unplug the system. I would say uh, it is kind of a, you know, a, 
a previous fallacy that you should just yank the system out of your uh, network right away, but actually you want to monitor the network for a while and find out what's going on, where is it making DNS calls to, where is it making callouts to. Um, you're going to have a much better chance of remediating your problem if you understand what it's doing first. And um, you know, if an hour is going to make all the difference in the world about leaking the data, you know, I, I kind of doubt that. It's probably already gone. Um, don't use a domain account. If you log into a Windows system with a domain account, it caches your credentials on there. They can use those to replay attacks all over the domain, so don't do that. Um, have a replacement machine for the user. It works a lot better when you show up and you say, hey, I need to take your laptop. It's infected. Uh, you're going to get a lot better cooperation if you have a replacement machine for them, and here you can work on this in the meantime. Um, you want to make sure that you have a plan. Uh, as far as, you know, you don't want to be flailing around looking for stuff. You want to have a point in time that you're looking for, you're looking for jar files, you're looking for Swift files. Have an idea of what it is that you're looking for before you start. Keep good records. I'm terrible at this. Um, but this is actually really important for being able to go back and justify either additional controls or additional spend in the future because you can say, hey, we had 20 incidents and uh, 18 of those were because of Java. Um, and don't spend more time on it than necessary. It's really easy to geek out, uh, <laughs> believe me, um, but make sure that you're spending your time valuably. Um, some other places to look for helpful clues during an incident, IDS alerts, and the nice thing, uh, the, the approach I use with the IDS is you get one alert, and then you take that IP address, and you use that as a source destination search, and you look through the IDS for all the other alerts and see if you can correlate that with other events. Dr. Watson reports, if you have these turned on, um, our IDS actually picks up the Dr. Watson reports, which is really nice because you can see when the process crashed. You're like, hmm, oh, Internet Explorer crashed right after you went to a black hole website. Hmm. Um, uh, network data, uh, NTOP, NetFlow, uh, DNS query logs. Have a span port already configured so that when you're having a weird incident, you already have a span port allocated and you can just plug right into that or you can just turn on your TCP dump. Thank you. Um, logs, remote access logs, uh, these are pretty valuable. I'm going to blaze through the rest of this because we're running a little short of time. Uh, so going through some demonstration of a couple of these tools, Cuckoo Sandbox is one that I use. I love this. And the, the way that you would do this is um, if you went out to a, a, a website and you downloaded a piece of malware um, that your user got infected with, or you find this in the antivirus quarantine, um, you can put this into Cuckoo and, or you found it in the file system. And you can see, OK, you can run this. And what exactly is this doing? So here's an analysis I did of some malware I just found out in the public. And what I thought was interesting about this is this malware is actually checking the open windows in the system to find out if you're running sys internals or Wireshark. So this malware is actually trying to figure out if it's in an analysis sandbox. And presumably, it's going to do something like shut down or just ignore the important bits. And it's also checking to see whether debugger is present, so it wants to know if it's being debugged. This one is really interesting. This is a poison ivy sample that I found just out in the wild. I wanted to find a poison ivy sample. I found one. Um, this is an example of UPX packer detection in Cuckoo. Um, also, the callout C2 domain for this is a well-known Chinese um, free DNS service. And the IP address, or the host name there, looks like a DNS calc. Um, so this looks like it's dynamically calculating the uh, C2. And uh, if you look up that IP address, not surprisingly, uh, this is our friends in the PRC. And uh, it's kind of funny because I just went looking for a poison ivy sample and I found one that did a callback to China. <laughs> so I think it's sort of funny when people say, oh, this APT stuff, it's all made up. Oh, really? Have you been looking? Um, volatility, like I said, this is a hugely powerful tool. Just going to run through this really quickly. Um, this is an example of running Malfine on a memory image. And this is actually a. Um, uh, Meterpreter session that I had open. So I ran this in a VM, ran Meterpreter, and found Meterpreter in memory. Right there it is. Um, this is the output of Shimcache. You might be familiar with Prefetch, um, which is basically a, a prefetch files in the Windows file system. But the Shimcache actually you can grab out of memory. And um, so far as anyone knows, you can't time stomp this. Um, so, and, and it just keeps going forever. Like it just is an ever going list of all of the executables that you've run on the system, which is awesome. You can grab that with volatility. Um, IE history, this is not necessarily the best way to get your internet history. Uh, it's just a demonstration of how to do this. In this case, I was trying to run an exploit. It wasn't working. I was like, what's going on here? Uh, and so I went out to a Java test site to see, well, is Java even working in my browser? Um, so, but you can see all that in the memory image. Uh, this is Hopper Disassembler. Uh, it's similar to um, uh, IDA Pro. It, it's not free, but it's very low cost, especially con uh, uh, compared to IDA Pro. And um, that was a, a little bit of a weird uh, analysis here. It's like, what's going on? This is jumping all over the place. But actually, if you look a little bit deeper in this binary, you see it's UPX packed. And so that part of the analysis, or the disassembly, was unpacking the UPX sections. 
Um, this one uh, is kind of a funny example. This one came off of full disclosure, and um, this is the Linux rootkit that somebody just posted the full disclosure and like, hey guys, has anybody seen this before? Uh, I opened it up immediately with Hopper, and I thought it was a joke. I thought it was a hoax because of all these symbol names were all we're all in here. I know they're kind of hard to make out. Um, you can go read the blog post right here that does the analysis. But basically, they did some. Uh, they had some errors in their malware, uh, which resulted in all of that being in memory, um, perfectly available to uh, <laughs> grab all the symbols. So you know, I kind of figured, like, hey, here I am. Um, some other screenshots. A popper disassembler. You can do, like I said, most all the features by the pro. Uh, at very low cost, so it's great if you're just getting started and then you can move up to the bigger tools later. Just some references here really quickly of stuff that I found hugely helpful. Um, there is uh, Richard Baiklick, if you go out and read his reviews and like uh, the books that he liked and then find, you know, look on Amazon and people who bought this book also bought. Um, that's a really huge uh, resource. The Sniper Forensic series, it's kind of difficult to find that on the, on the spider like uh, blog, you can't link to it, but if you search for Sniper Forensics, um, and the APT attacks with Metasploit. Has anybody seen that one? That one is really cool, I thought, because basically the guy is attacking a VM with Metasploit and then going through and doing the forensics on the, uh, in the box that he attacked. Um, some tools here, just really quickly, I mentioned Sys Internals, Memorize Up to K Imager, Immunity Debugger, Free, uh, Hopper, uh, Cuckoo Sandbox, Thug is really interesting. Thug is basically an emulated browser, and so you can run that on a malicious website and it will tell you everything that website tried to do uh, to your system. Uh, just a few odds and ends here. The Forensics Wiki, it's not terribly robust, but it actually has some really good examples of tools to use in really kind of obscure log files and things like that. Uh, and uh, Twitter, just try to hang out with as many people, follow as many people, gather uh, information. There's this 4N6, very clever uh, tag that a lot of forensics people use. And that's it. So thanks everybody for coming out to my talk. Um, the slides are actually already up there. And um, you can get a hold of me. Feel free to ask me any kind of questions or if you have any tips. I would love to hear tips as well. Thanks.